Hey, tailgaters! Ross of the Pigskin Tales Podcast here. Feel that summer heat? It's not just the sun, it's the thrill of upcoming college football season, stoking the coals. So get ready for the season, dive into the history books with Homefield, the premium collegiate apparel brand from Indianapolis. Homefield crafts incredibly comfortable gear designed with iconic vintage nods over 150 colleges. A library of history right on your chest. Homefield is the Indiana Jones of collegiate apparel, uncovering hidden gems from school archives. Unique mascots, logos, and even unforgettable moments frozen in time. Visit homefieldapparel.com and shop the archives. Homefield Apparel, where comfort, nostalgia, and the spirit of college football history unite. Again, that's homefieldapparel.com. So glad this day has finally come. We are here to celebrate the birth and the, the great career of Glenn Scobie, Pop Warner, the great football coach and innovator. We have author and historian and his biographer, Jeffrey Miller, with us today to talk about his book from a few years ago on the life of Pop Warner. We have Jeff joining us here in just a moment to tell us all about the great Pop Warner. This is the Pigskin Daily History Dispatch, a podcast that covers the anniversaries of American football events throughout history on a day-to-day basis. Your host, Darren Hayes, is podcasting from America's North Shore to bring you the memories of the gridiron one day at a time. So as we come out of the tunnel of the Sports History Network, let's take the field and go no huddle through the portal of positive gridiron history with pigskindispatch.com. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Hello, my football friends. This is Darren Hayes of pigskindispatch.com. Welcome once again to the Pig Pen, your portal to positive football history. And we are going to be looking through that portal today, almost 130, 140 years to go back into life of one of the great football innovators that still celebrated today, and his name is very much associated with the game of football. And we have his biographer, a friend of the show who's been on with us before, uh, Jeff Miller. Uh, Jeff, welcome to the pig pen. Thanks for having me, Darren. Glad to be here. Yeah, Jeff, uh, you know, you had a, this book you wrote probably, I don't know, five, six years ago, maybe longer mm-hmm. than that, that I just discovered recently. And I've been in touch with you about it as I've been reading it and enjoying it on Glenn Pop Warner, uh, the mm-hmm. great coach and, and innovator of the game, uh, one of the, the people that I hold in high regards of making football what it is today. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I guess, Jeff, what what was sort of your inspiration for, for writing a biography about uh, Pop Warner? I'm from Springville, um, which is Pop's hometown. And uh, I, was, I was doing a book signing event here in Springville on a Buffalo Bills book that I had written, and uh, in the audience just happened to be my third grade teacher. Now, you know, this is, you know, I'm 61 now. So, I mean, you know, we're talking, this is 50 years beyond um, <laughs> or, or whatever, <laughs> third grade. But she happened to be there and she was one of my favorite teachers, actually. Um, and she now lives in Springville also. Um, and after the after this presentation, she came up to me and she said, you know, no one's ever done any, written anything about Pop Warner. And I just looked at her. I'm like, I, I read about professional football. And she goes, yeah, but somebody really should do something about Pop Warner. He, I mean, he, he's so he's our most famous citizen and somebody should do something. So, you know, I kind of filed it away as, you know, just like, OK, she's <laughs> <laughs> she's out of her mind. You know, I, I just didn't I never really thought about writing about Pop Warner. But the more I thought about it, you know, I. I walk around town and he just happens to be buried about 500 yards from where I live. And, you know, it just, it just seemed like, you know, the stars were aligning and I was supposed, I was meant to do this. I, 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 at one point, I can't remember when I just decided, you know what, maybe, maybe, you know, his, his story needs to be told. And, you know, I, I was, I had just written or, or just read a biography of John Heisman. And I thought, man, you know, somebody, somebody should tell Pop. Warner's story. He's more famous than John Heisman. Yeah, there's the Heisman Trophy, but there's Pop Warner Little League football. I mean, this mm-hmm. is this is everywhere. Every town has a has a Little League football team, and it's named after Pop Warner. So I thought, okay. 
so I, I, I just decided to write it. And, um, you know, it, it's turned out to be a, a pretty big thing around here. The Springville is a, a small town. Um, we don't have a lot of famous people who come from here. Um, so a biography of Pop Warner was well received. I, I, as we were talking before we went on the air, that uh, there's not a, there wasn't a lot of information in this town about Pop because all of his coaching career was outside of you know the state. He, he coached at Cornell, he coached at Car Carlisle, he coached at Stanford, Temple, Pitt. Um, so you know all of his papers are spread far and wide. There's nothing really here on Pop in terms of archives. So a lot of the a lot of the uh, research was done online. And, um, but I think that I was able to bring enough research and information together to make a, a really credible biography of him and make the town of Springville proud and, you know, be able to say, yeah, this is our guy. Yeah. As a person that's read the book, you definitely made, uh, your, your town very proud by the way Thank you, you. <laughs> uh, you really represented Pop Warner's story very well. Uh, Thank the you. good, the bad and everything in between, yep. uh, you know, mostly good, but you, you, I mean, you even you know, shadowed some of his skeletons that he might've had in his life too, which is part of who he was and right. part of his character. And you, you got to understand the, the era you know, he, he lived in too, of, you know, he started what coaching in the late 1890s or mid 1890s yeah, 1890s. yeah. he started coaching at iowa in the late 1890s he was coaching two colleges at the same time um, which is kind of weird but he accepted an offer from the university of iowa to coach and um at the same time he, he accepted a, a, an offer from another college and he thought well what i'll do is i'll go up to iowa for a month i'll set up a system that i like i'll get the the captain of the team to be my assistant coach and then I'll be, I'll, I'll move on to Georgia and the University of Georgia. And then I can communicate by telegram with the coach back in Iowa. They'll run my system. And so basically I'll get credit for two colleges. And um, so he did that for a couple of years and um, he did so pretty successfully. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I love the one part in the book where you said, I think when he, uh, was told Georgia University of Georgia because he got that job second and they offered him yeah. quite a bit more money than than yes. Iowa did, and uh, he told Georgia he said, "Hey, uh, yeah, I'm, I can't get there until you know September seventeenth or whatever whatever yeah. the date was, sometime later in September." And uh, you know they bought it and said, "Oh yeah," and they gave him sure. a raise I think by by saying, <laughs> "Hey, yeah, we want you. <laughs> we just need somebody." <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that different different era, different times, and. Oh. Uh, so again, so let's take a, a step back from that before his coaching. How, how did Pop get involved with the game of football? Well, Pop played, uh, he never played high school football. Um, even though the, the, the football field at uh, Springville Griffith Institute, which is our local high school here, um, the football field is named Pop Warner Field, but he never played there. He, he grew up playing like a pickup type of football game and, and they, they would, play with a pig's bladder that was um, blown up and sealed off at both ends. So it would, you know, mimic the size of, or the shape of a football, but he never had an actual football when he was a kid. Um, his favorite sport was baseball. Um, but when he went to Cornell, when he was on his way there to go to college, he ran into a guy who just happened to be the coach of the Cornell football team. And, and pop was a big guy. He was like six to 200 and some odd pounds. And, and the, the coach said to him, you know, you, you should come out for the football team. You know, you're, you're, you ever play before? And he said, no, but I think I can handle it. And so he went out that day. And when he got there, he went out for the football team and um, they, they made him a guard. And um, because he was actually older than anybody else on the team, somebody at one point called him Pop, um, you know, for being so old. And the nickname stuck. <laughs> this is a uh, at Cornell. Wow, yeah. it's uh, it's interesting. I, I I found it was even interesting how he ended up attending Cornell. Uh, you know, because you you describe in the book how his family, you know, originally from in Springville, they decided to pack up and become ranchers or, or something, mm -hmm. some kind of farming right. uh, agricultural down in Texas. You know, quite right. a quite a distance from Springville, New York, which is a little bit south of Buffalo. Uh, <laughs> But uh, it, was, it was interesting. If you could maybe share that little tale of how Pop came home and, and what transpired there. 
Sure. Pop came home at one point because his family had gone to Texas, but he came home for a visit. And while he was here, he went to the racetrack in Buffalo. And when he was there, he won a lot of money. And he thought, I have a system. I, I can do this. I can make a living, you know, gambling. And when he went back, he ended up losing money. And then he lost more money, lost more money. And he had eventually lost all of his money. And he wired his father that he needed more money. And um, when he did that, he, he said, I better have a good reason for needing more money. My father gave me a sufficient amount of money. So he's going to want to know what happened to it. So he told his father he needed the money for tuition to go to school. And he wasn't really planning on going to school. But um, when his father sent him the money, he, he, I guess he had second thoughts and he decided, well, I better, I better, you know, um, you know, tell the truth and go to school. So he wound up um, applying at Cornell, got accepted and went off to law school. In those days, you didn't have to have great grades in high school or anything, I guess. <laughs> you could just apply if you had the money, you, you went to law school. And that's what he did. He went to Cornell to study to be a lawyer, which he actually did, and actually did pass the bar and became a lawyer. Um, but football kind of took him down another road. So, hmm. uh, yeah, yeah. He, he went He went to Cornell mainly because he had to save face because – um, otherwise, he'd have to tell his dad the truth that he lost all his money gambling. Yeah, that would have been a tough conversation to have with your father. You spend all his money uh, having, right. having a good time uh, back home. Right. So, so that's a pretty interesting story. Okay, so so he's at Cornell. He's uh, getting his first real taste of organized football, from from what you're saying. And and how how did that go? How did he do as a player? He did pretty well. He he, he felt if he would have had. Uh, formal training or at least you know, played in high school, had, had coaching, that he could have been an All-American. And, you know, it, 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 some people, you know, they might, that might sound braggadocious, but, you know, he, he, was a, he was a shrewd judge of football material. So I think that he kind of knew that he had the ability, but he just never had the training. He played there for two years, and he played well enough to be captain one year and also to be asked to be a coach after his playing career. So he must have done pretty well and made a name for himself as a, as a player. He, he was a guard. He was innovative even when he was a, a player. As a lineman, he had to coach, the, he were coach but he took over um, running the team one game and he inserted one of his own plays, which was a guard's, re, a, you know, a guard around, you know, as opposed to an end around. It was a guard around play. And of course it went to him. <laughs> and um, so the, the quarterback, you know, turned and rather than handing off to the halfback or the fullback, around came pop from the guard position and he, you know, he, he got the ball and he, he claims he got about 20 yards downfield before he lost his balance because he wasn't accustomed to sprinting. But, um, you know, he, the, the innovation started early in other words, you know, so he, he was already into the trickery by, by the time he was in college. So. Oh, very, very interesting. Okay. Yeah. So his, uh, he ended up uh, leaving uh, Cornell because he, he, you know, he had his degree in law when he graduated and he mm -hmm. did that for a little bit. You describe in a book and sort of became disinterested in it. He sort of yeah. had that. Uh, he had the bug uh, of football. Exactly. In him. Exactly. So, so where, where did he go from there with the, you know, he left the law degree and, and ended up getting into coaching. Well, he got contacted by somebody from Cornell who said that um, the university of Iowa was looking for a coach and, um, would they mind if they put his name in? And he was sure more than happy to do so. He he was bored being a lawyer. He didn't want to sit in an office. He wanted to be, you know, out there, um, you know, on the, on the football field. So he accepted that. And at the same time, or right around the same time, he had applied for, um, he applied for a position with the University of Georgia. And he accepted Iowa first, but then he thought, well, I can, I can do that. I can I can coach at Iowa for a month, and then once I get my system, <laughs> quote unquote, in place at Iowa, I can just have the 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 captain of the team take over as my coach, and then I can go to Georgia and I can install my system there, and then I can run both teams by telegram. You know, I can run Iowa by telegram, and I can be on the field in Georgia. And so that's what he did. He was running two teams at the same time for the first couple of years. 
Man, I, I am just jealous of people like that that can come up with these uh, dubious schemes to to leverage their time to to you know make double the money. And he he certainly did. I, I mean, who would ever think of doing something like that? That's uh, I found that really interesting. Well, but, when when you when you look at his history of you know um, using tricks and and trick plays and skullduggery and <laughs> and you know um, deception. It, it it all makes sense. I mean, he always did things like this. He was always thinking, you know, what can I, what else can I do? What, uh, you know, what, what innovation can work? What, what, you know, misdirection can work. But that was, he was constantly, his mind was going a mile a minute constantly. Hmm. Now, okay. He had, he had some kind of uh, interesting uh, things happen when he was coaching at Georgia. I think, what do you have like two or three years, I believe at Georgia, yeah. but he had uh, one of the, uh, I guess big plays uh, prior to 1906 before the the forward pass was legalized with, you know, we all know that story with Teddy Roosevelt getting involved and everything, but he had mm-hmm. sort of a famous play when Georgia played North Carolina in a game. And it sort of uh, the game ended on a player got, was the major factor in a game for, for Georgia uh, against North Carolina. Yeah. Um, North Carolina used, used the forward pass illegally because it had not yet been legalized at that point. And the way the story was told was the pass was actually used as desperation. It wasn't, it wasn't a planned play. Um, their, their punter um, was rushed and, and went out to the side and just threw the ball down the field. And their receiver caught it. And I, at this point, I can't remember if he went for a touchdown or, or whatever it was, but it was a turning point in the game. And coach, you know, coach, uh, Warner was apoplectic at this point, you know, like, you know, the, the, it was illegal. You can't throw the ball. And the referee inexplicably um, said he didn't see it. <laughs> you know, I didn't see the play. Well, worry, where, where were you looking? <laughs> you know, um, but he said he didn't see it. So they got away with the forward pass and pop was never, you know, he gets a lot of credit for innovation, but he was never an, an exponent of the forward pass. He never, he never really wanted to use it until he got to Carlisle. Um, and even then it was grudgingly because he had, you know, he had some players who could throw the ball, but um, he, he, he stored that away and he, he thought, well, geez, you know. Um, and so, you know, when, when, the, when it was finally legalized in 1906, he was, you know, that's when he was out, you know, heading towards Carlisle. He was still at Cornell, but, you know, he was getting ready to, you know, Developed a single wing and, and kind of in a, you know innovate the whole way the game was played, and the forward pass was part of that. So you can see kind of a lineage between that pass and where he wound up with the single wing because you know it it was it was an extension of the single wing being able to you know fake a handoff and roll out and throw the ball down the field. So yeah, uh, I think there's we're going to talk about another time here in a little bit about uh, you know. Pop Warner definitely could uh, capitulate on his stance on certain uh, aspects of the game and, and turn on dime. Like, you know, he didn't, didn't was, was not a proponent of the forward pass in mm-hmm. late 1890s when this occurred, but, you know, less than 10 years later, he's, he's he was, right. it probably more than anybody in those early years. So yeah. kind of, kind of interesting. Uh, but I guess it's, well, he's still at Georgia. He ended up having a, uh, a meeting with a head to head meeting with another famous coach who you mentioned a little bit earlier and John Heisman, who was mm-hmm. coaching at Auburn and a couple interesting uh, games that they had in consecutive years of, of his, of them both coaching those two schools. Pop, Pop is in his, I believe his first year at Georgia and mm-hmm. he's telling the, telling his team, he knows they have to play Auburn. And he says, you know, maybe we better go scout these guys a little bit. And uh, some of his, um, the people that are down there, some of the people that are helping him with the team, like, hey, you know, we, we cleaned their clocks last year. You don't need to go check on Auburn because, you know, they're, we, we killed them last year. And so he doesn't scout them. And the results were uh, a little bit less than. Bobbered, right. Or, yeah. So Heisman had some things ready because Heisman did come and watch uh, Georgia play one of their games, picked up on a couple of things and ended up being a uh, key to victory for, for Auburn in that game, year. And uh, even pop going back to what we were talking about earlier, pop did not like scouting. He, he, at first he did not believe in it. He thought, well, you know, you, you, the best team wins. You just get out there, you line up and you, you, you know, you go head to head, you kick their ass and you, you know, that, that's it. You, you, you win 
whatever team is the better team is going to win. You didn't think about all that scouting stuff until later on. And then, you know, once he got to Carl again, once he got to Carlisle and he saw that all his players were either small or he didn't have a lot of players there, he had to go out and scouting and looking for players because it wasn't just about scouting the other team, but he had to go out and scout for other players. But then he also had to scout the other team because, you know, it, it was at a different level. Now he's starting to play teams like Harvard and Princeton and, and all that. So, you know, it, 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 you know, one again, you can see the lineage where one thing leads to another and, you know, a change in his belief system. Yeah, I found that, you know, that, that's one thing that you really portrayed in the book and in many instances where Pop sort of got educated on the job and mm-hmm. it changed his philosophy on, yeah. on different things. And that that's definitely one of the scouting uh, things. And we're, we'll talk about a few more here in a bit of uh, during his mm-hmm. career, uh, j- but just some great things. But ended up the next year. Uh, he played when uh, Georgia in Auburn played. It was a little bit different result. He got a little bit more intel on on uh, Auburn mm-hmm. and uh, Heisman you know, play in particular, which we'll, we'll talk about in another episode. Uh, okay. That uh, he ended up Pop got the better of him. So I think they end up splitting their their series when they were, went head to head down there in the, the southern uh, states. So uh, real interesting. So okay, so he gets done with Georgia. He's done done it. I think he still goes on a little bit at Iowa, but where where does he go from Georgia? What makes him uh, leads him away from coaching at Georgia? Well, uh, when he was at Georgia, um, I, 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 Cor- Cornell came calling, you know. So I, I think it was more of a chance to go back to his alma mater and, and coach there. Um, he loved Cornell, and you know, to the day to the day he died, you know, he he said that that was the one place that he he loved the most. I mean, he's, he had three stints there, you know, one as a player, twice as a coach. Um, So I I think it was really just the allure of being able to go back and coach where he played. Okay. And I I believe they offered him a a lot bigger sum of money too. than but the the, the (laughs) there's that, (laughs) but I I think, I believe he still coached at Iowa for another year or two. Same thing with Cornell. So, Hey, I can't get there till later in September, but (laughs) I I remember too, that Cornell was an Ivy league school. So it was, it was, you know, it was a bigger, bigger deal there. Okay. So he he has some pretty good success at Cornell and, Mm -hmm. You know, we we know that uh, probably one of his more famous uh, teams is is with the Carlisle and that right. was down in Pennsylvania. So, how does he go from Cornell, his alma mater, who he loves being there, and ends up at a smaller school right. for for Native Americans in Carlisle? Well, when he was at Carlisle, they played the, or Cornell, they played Carlisle, and he 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 liked their speed and you know the. the he could see that they they were good with the misdirection and stuff like that. But, you know, they had to be because they couldn't compete, you know, head to head with these bigger teams. Um, but what what happened at Cornell was um, when the last year he was there, there was an assistant coach or well, the captain of the team um, who was usually the assistant coach um, was lobbying with the with the officials to the school officials to take his job. He wanted to be the he wanted to be that coach, so um, Pop, you know, I guess this player was pretty popular, and Pop probably figured, well, you know, I'm gonna, you know, I want it's probably time for me to move on. I'm probably not going to win this this battle. He had a pretty good record. He was like 15 and five at that point, um, but um, the the assistant coach just happened to be a very popular person on campus. So Pop. You know, Pop was thinking about Carlisle, and he actually set up a meeting with uh, with uh, Captain Pratt, who was the superintendent of Carlisle, and they met. And when they met, you know, they found out um, Superintendent Pratt, who was a Civil War hero, and had started um, some of the you know, some of the Indian schools. And you know, obviously, there's there's a there's a movement now, you know. Um, you know, to, to disparage the, the Indian schools and rightly so. I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not defending the, the Indian schools and their methods, but um, he, you know, he was really kind of progressive at the time because, you know, there was, there were people there that believed, you know, the only good Indian was a dead Indian. I mean, there, there were this kind of philosophy at, in, in America at the time. So he thought, no, you know, we can educate the Indian and civilize him, you know, which, you know, obviously, you know, we wouldn't think that way now, but, you know, rather than eradicate the red man, you know, he thought, let's save the red man and, you know, hopefully civilize him. But 
anyway. Um, so they met and Pop realized that they had a lot in common. They both came from small towns in, in Western New York and they had both um, had been tinsmith. They had both been apprentices as tinsmiths. Um, you know, he had been in the Civil War and Pop's father had fought in the Civil War. They were both excellent horsemen. There was a lot of things they had in common. So um, Pop thought, thought this is perfect. So, you know, he goes on to Carlisle and at Carlisle, he has a, a great success with a small team because they're fast. He knows how to utilize their their agility, their speed, um, their love of this deception. And they're, they're um, you know, they they love to when when they could beat a team of white men, they they you know, they loved it. So they they wanted to play for Pop because Pop knew how to how to, you know, uh, develop a game plan, so to speak. So he had really good, good um good success at Carlisle. I, I thought it was real interesting. You you talked about his early days at Carlisle and, you know, Pop came from the, the culture of, you know, some of the, the coaches that uh, use profanity and, uh, you know, got, got on a player's case if yeah. they you know, messed up yeah. and just, you know, very, very strict as a coach and yeah. you know, tell the tale of how he sort of, again, learned from, from his environment and what was going on. And maybe if you could share with that, with the, sure. the Carlisle players. Yeah. He, 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 you know, he was a gruff guy. He, you know, he, you, you didn't do your job. He'd say, you son of a B, you know, what's the matter with you? Get your butt moving you know, in more graphic terms. And, you know, here we're at the Carlisle school where, you know, we're not just trying to civilize the red man. We're trying to Christianize the red man. So we're teaching them to be Christian gentlemen. You don't swear. You're a good sport. You know, all this stuff. And then you get this gruff guy, you know, from, you know, Western New York, Texas, you know, Cornell, whatever. And he comes in and he's swearing at them and, you know, he's belittling them and he's he's saying things that they don't like. And eventually the players are quitting the team. And he doesn't understand where, you know, where's Joe? Where's, where's, you know, Bob? Why aren't they at practice? Oh, they quit. Why'd they quit? Oh, they don't want to come here and play anymore. So he had to learn. He had to learn the hard way. Like, well, I better, I better cool it if I, if I want to have a team. So, um, you know, he, he says that, you know, he learned his lesson and he no longer spoke that way to the players. Well, you know, I'm sure you don't just change like that, but, um, you know, I think he learned his lesson about how far he could go with, with some of these players. So, yeah, so that's a big uh, coaching style change where he had been, you know, years sure. and years at three different collegiate teams where he he was probably acting in that way and, and changed for, oh, sure. for th this group of uh, young men that he was coaching. And yeah. they, they seems like they responded pretty well to it because they had a, a pretty decent season, uh, yeah. you know, his years at Carlisle. And, yeah, uh, he, 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 I think they ended up liking him. I'm, I'm, you know, I, I know that there are accounts of players who didn't, but there are more accounts of players who did like him and who um, stood by him, you know, as he got older. Um, so I, I tend to believe that they, they learned to respect him. Yeah, I, I found it was really uh, an interesting piece at, at Carlisle, you know, the, the, the pre Jim Thorpe years. Uh, where you, you talked about a game that I didn't really know existed where Carlisle traveled out to the West coast and played a holiday mm -hmm. game. And I don't yeah. know if you, if you can talk about that a little bit. Uh, well, I'll try to remember. <laughs> I, I do know that I, I remember the trip cause they, they, you know, they took the train. It was the first time they had gone that far and they, they would have to, they would every, every time the train would stop, they get out and they, 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 they do signal drills and they, they go through calisthenics and things like that. Um, but um, I'm not sure which game you're referring to, but I do know the one the, the one game was when they played at Haskell Indian School, which is out in Oklahoma, I believe. And mm -hmm. um, one of the you know one of the players, one of the people that was there was Jim Thorpe. And um, when he when the when the Carlisle Indian players who were already famous because they had some guys on the team who were all Americans, um, you know. Uh, Joseph Seneca and Mount St. Pleasant, I think James Johnson. I can't remember which ones were on the team at the time, but um, you know, but they were they were pretty well known, and they were you know other Native American groups. You know, they, they, these guys were superstars. You know, they, 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 this was you, know, you you could have had the you know the you know the Kansas City Chiefs or the or the Boston Celtics walk in. I mean, that's that's the magnitude that the you know the the respect that they had for these people. 
So when they came in, they made a very good impression on, on, on the students there. And, you know, so some of them ended up going to Carlisle because of this visit that, that the team made to that school. Yeah, you you talked about you know some of the training on the team, uh, you know before you played when they played Haskell. Uh, you described how when the train would go uphill, he'd have the players inside the car, sort of running yeah. running the the aisleway of the the train yeah. car, you know, to so yeah. they're getting their workout, you know, uh, going yeah. up elevation. I thought that was interesting, and uh, they, they made a couple stops. So they were going to be playing, uh, I believe, it was California uh, on a Christmas Day game. I believe is. Maybe mm-hmm. it's either Cal or Stanford. I was pretty sure it was Cal. And uh, so they along the way, somebody, there was an older gentleman who knew, you know, oh. who asked about the team a little bit, uh, had a conversation with Pop. Uh, uh, yeah. Sort of, if you want to. And he correct. said, good luck because, um, you know, no team has ever beaten them or something. I can't remember the quote, but, you know, uh, good luck because, uh, I can't remember the quote now. It's been a while since I wrote it. Um, I don't know if you have it there, but um, no, that, that's the basic like, gist of it. You know, you, they yeah, were like no nine and over. Now you're going on. It's a long way to go to get your ass kicked or something like that. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, and uh, what the outcome of that game ended up being? Yeah, that's the one where they had a the football that was the 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 um, was not regulation size, and the and the field was sand, and mm-hmm. you know it's almost like California didn't know anything about organized football they just they were just kind of adopting the game and you know they just kind of made things up as they went along you know trying to mimic the game from the east and you know they get out there and like the football's the wrong size and the fields you know you can't run on sand and but you know they they still ended up winning yeah i I thought that was interesting another trip uh, with he took with carlo i found it interesting is when they they traveled one year to go play uh fielding yost michigan teams one of his great teams and they were a little bit banged up. They had some games prior to that. They had some, uh, a couple guys as they got to Chicago, uh, defected from the team because they thought mm-hmm. they, you know, was halfway home to back to, you know, the, mm-hmm. the reservation or wherever the, they were living back where their, their folks were. And so they defected from the team. So he's, he's real short handed going into Michigan, uh, to play, a, you know, usually pretty tough fielding Yost team. And, uh, so, Pop goes, you know, two legends talking and Pop goes to, and your book describes to Yost, hey, you know, I'm, can we shorten these games a little bit, this game a little bit, these quarters? Cause I'm, my guys are hurting. Uh, he had another guy get hurt, I think mm-hmm. right, right before the game, uh, wasn't able to play separate a shoulder or something. Uh, and, and I thought it was kind of interesting uh, what Yost uh, said, said to him on that. Um, he basically said, you know, we're not shortening a game. You're this is a football game and you know, you're here to play and <laughs> yeah. that's your your tough luck and yeah. and uh, you know, Michigan won kind of handily on that. But uh yeah. a good another good lesson learned for for Pop Warner, which I'm sure he, he used yeah. later on in his career. But it also tells you something about the competitive nature of these great coaches. I mean, Phil Yos is 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 a legend. And you know, and through and through the whole book and through his whole career, you see all these great Coach, you know, he played. He had a rivalry with Heisman, with Stag, with with Yost, with you know um, Rockney, and you know all these great coaches. And and it's kind of neat to see that you know they they respected each other. They even became really close friends with you know it's in, in some cases. But there was this rivalry. You know they they were all you know you know they all wanted to be the number the guy the the coach the the authority. And you know, and many of them were. <laughs> you know. Yeah, and he ended up. I mean, another one he had a great rivalry with some of his uh, former players or assistants. You know, he had you know Jock Sutherland took over for him yeah. at Pitt, and he went to Stanford. I think they played a Rose Bowl game against each other. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, their teams played, and uh, uh, just uh, just some great names. Uh, a lot of mm-hmm. a lot of good name dropping of coaches. These legendary coaches all, yeah. all playing against Pop Warner and playing each other. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of fascinating. Now he he had you know a lot of different innovations. Uh, during his long tenure at coaching at all these places, maybe you could just uh, touch on some of those, uh, what Pop Warner brought into to college football. Sure. Uh, well, the first and most obvious one is a single wing. And, and, you know, that was kind of a, you know, you know, he, he wanted, he was a master of deception, misdirection. And, you know, he didn't like the whole, um, you know, the mass momentum plays and they were being outlawed anyways. Okay. You know, Teddy Roosevelt, you know, said, you guys really need to clean up the game. And, you know, they, they changed, they, they made a lot of rule changes, including you know, the line of scrimmage and the board pass and all this stuff. So, um, 
Warner Warner thought, well, you know, if we can, we're we're not going to use mass momentum. I don't, you know, I I I want to use some of the things that I always believed in, like trickery or you know, end arounds, reverses, you know, um, triple triple fake handoffs, things like that. So that's where the single wing came in. So you know, it, it was a T formation up until 1906, and then he developed the single wing, and eventually, a single wing becomes the format, the standard formation for every every team except you know, Chicago Bears. Okay, but, you know, for the next 15 years, it's it's pretty much the um, the go-to formation. And then he also invented this, the double wing. So the single wing has one wingman out on the side, usually to the right. Um, with a double wing, you have wingmen on both sides. And it's more it's more versatile. It can run to either, either way very easily, where if you run the single wing, Whatever side you put the wing on is usually the side you're going to. With a double wing, you don't know. So that that again you know, was a big deal. Um, you know, he he came up with um, the hidden ball trick, which you know, um, stuff the ball up the back of the of a player's jersey. You know, um, while everybody's standing in a huddle, so the 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 other side doesn't know who has the ball. Everybody turns around and starts running. And, you know, the guy who has the football is, you know, isn't going to have everybody chasing after him because nobody knows which one has it. And the play worked successfully and um, eventually got outlawed. Uh, um, he came up, you know, he, he was As also... a for- former official, I'm glad that that happened, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, he came up with, um, he, he came up with the idea of hardened uh, shoulder pads. You know, he, um, they didn't have plastic at the time. And um, he used fiberglass to to, to um, give it the rigidity it needed um, for, to to provide more protection for the shoulder pads and, and other pads, you know, in the thighs and things like that. Um, you know, he 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 uh, improved the the you know things like the tackling dummy and um, you know the, they they give him credit for coming up with the the spiral punt. Which um, you know, usually when when the ball was wa- melon shaped, you just kicked it and it went in over end, and you hoped it bounced and kept going with the spiral. With the spiral, it was, obviously you wanted to get it so it it was more aerodynamic as it passed through the air and got more distance. Um, he was given credit for the uh, three point stance, which he adapted from track and field um, prior to uh, 1911 halfbacks and fullbacks in the backfield would 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 start at a two-point stance hands on knees slightly crouched um pop noticed that in track and field when when runners were starting their sprint when they started from the three-point stance they got they took off faster than they did from the two-point stance because normally in the two-point stance you take a step back before you take off in in the three-point stance you're already down there and you just you just shoot right off from the gun. So, so there were, you know, several things that he was given credit for. Um, I don't, I can't think of anything else. Right here, but no, that's, 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 quite that's, a that's plenty right there. Yeah. Now, now we know, and you mentioned it earlier, we know that his name is synonymous with, with youth football. So how, how yeah. did, how did that connection come up? Cause you have this, this gruff guy yeah. that, you know, you don't really hear him talking. You know, I didn't read anything where he's, you know, coaching real young players, except maybe you know, mm-hmm. some of the younger Native Americans at Carlisle and that. But he's mostly a, a collegiate coach. And uh, so, right. how how does that connection come about? He was coaching at Temple, and this is later in his career. And so he's in Philadelphia, and there's a little league football circuit or team or league, a little league. There's a little league <laughs> football mm-hmm. league, and. um he was invited to speak to at a banquet, like end of the season banquet. And he was, he was invited along with a bunch of other coaches in the area. And, you know, of course he's the most famous one. He's Pop Warner. And so he's the most famous guy in Philadelphia, but um, the banquet happens to be on uh, an evening when there's a snowstorm. So none of the other coaches who were supposed to be there show up. The only one who shows up was Pop Warner and he showed up an hour or so late. So nobody was expecting anybody to be there. And then all of a sudden he walks in and he walks up onto the stage and he gives a, a long, um, a long talk. They love him. You know, he stays for hours signing autographs, talking to the kids and the dads and they just love him. And people can't get enough of this. So they're talking about it for days. 
And the the powers that be of this league said, you know what, this guy, he's local, he's great, he, the people love him, you know, look what he did for these kids. Why don't we ask him to be our representative, or at least endorse us? So they asked him, and and they said, we want to we want to use your name, you know, on our on our league. And he gave them he gave them his consent. He never coached a little league team. Yeah, he never really had any connection to this league or any leagues at all. He just loaned his name. And to this day, you know, that was 1930, 30 something, and uh, 37, I believe. Um, and to this day, you know, 90 years later, whatever it is, he's, you know, the, the little leagues are still called Pop Warner Leagues. And even, the, you know, they have cheerleaders that are cheerleading, Pop Warner cheerleaders. So, you know, and, and sometimes it's derisive. Sometimes, you know, when you're using a simple offense in, in the pros, if they do something simple or they'll say, oh, they're just running a Pop Warner offense. Well, they don't, they don't realize it's kind of, they're actually, it's actually kind of a misnomer because you might be thinking that you're using it derogatorily towards, you know, little leagues, but you don't know how innovative Pop Warner really was. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so if you say you're running a Pop Warner offense, you know, you're, you're not really, not really an insult. <laughs> right, right. Yes, it's at the tip of innovation. At yeah. the time. Uh, but Jeff, you know, this has uh, been a great, great talk. Um, you know, I'm going to give you the opportunity to, to tell where people can get your book. And I apologize, we haven't said the name of the book yet. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we want to really get this out there. This is uh, April 5th that we're airing this on, and it is the, the birth date of Pop Warner. And mm -hmm. uh, so that's why we thought it was kind of special that we get together and get this recorded. So I, I apologize. So let's let's take time. Let's give the title of your book and where folks can get a copy of it at. Yeah, it's called Pop Warner, A Life on the Gridiron. Um, and you can get it on Amazon. Um, you can get it at Barnes & Noble online. Um, here, in, here in Western New York, you can get it at uh, Barnes & Noble uh, bookstores and local books like here in Springville. There's a couple of uh, sites, the Pop Warner Museum, where you can buy it and stuff like that. But um, if for those people listening across the country, Amazon, if you're interested, um, you can get it on Amazon or you can go to the McFarland uh, Press uh, website. Um, McFarland is the publisher. They did a fantastic job of putting it together for me. Um, so, you know, it's pretty it's pretty easy to get if you if you if you want to find it. OK, uh, Jeff Miller, we, we appreciate you coming on here talking about your book and this legend of the game, Pop Warner, and uh, really appreciate you, sir, and uh, for sharing this uh, great, great uh, man with us. Well, th thank you for having me on. It was It's a lot of fun. I always, talk, always have fun talking about pop. So thanks. Peeking up at the clock, the time's running down. We're going to go into victory formation, take a knee, and let this baby run out. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you back tomorrow for the next podcast. We invite you to check out our website, pigskindispatch.com, not only to see the daily football history, but to experience positive football with our many articles on the good people of the game, as well as our own football comic strip, Cleet Marks Comics. Pigskindispatch.com is also on social media outlets, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and don't forget the Pigskin Dispatch YouTube channel to get all of your positive football news and history. Special thanks to the talents of Mike and Gene Monroe, as well as Jason Neff for letting us use their music during our podcast. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Hey there, Sports History fan. This is Arnie Chapman, a.k.a. the Football History Dude, and I wanted to thank you for stopping by to listen to another episode here on the Sports History Network. Our podcasters are passionate about uncovering and sharing sports stories from yesteryear. And if you didn't know it already, we have over 30 shows across the network covering all sorts of sports history topics. In fact, here's a glimpse into one of our awesome podcasts here on the network. Each week, the official Football Learning Academy podcast will take you deep into the history of pro football through interviews with players, coaches, or administrators in the NFL, as well as interviews with pro football Hall of Fame selectors, authors, and historians, You'll learn how the game evolved and important moments that shaped the sport into what it is today. And don't miss the Pro Football History Nugget of the Week. Listen to the official Football Learning Academy podcast on the Sports History Network. How about that? I bet you're super hyped to go listen to that new podcast, right? Well, to learn about this show and all the other podcasts on the network, head over to sportshistorynetwork.com 
forward slash podcast. Again, that's sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash podcast. Head over there today to find your next favorite sports history podcast.